Bonjour à toutes. Bonjour à tous. Good morning, everybody. It's a huge pleasure to see you here Sunday morning at half past eight. I don't know whether it's difficult for you, but I'm full of admiration to see how many you are in the room. I'm quite sure we'll spend a very interesting hour together. The theme for this morning is how to reintroduce the long term in a government policy. It's a vast subject and there's tremendous tension, quite a contradiction between the very, very short term. Public policy has always been uh, subject to electoral cycles. There are many shocks. Like in the past few years in France, we've had an awful lot of uh, shocks, uh, perhaps more than in Europe and elsewhere. And what's a bit new and has been for the past decade is the reign of short-term information, i.e. we have the social networks. So government policy is sort of caught between very, very short cycles of news for the best, better or for the worse. When I was a member of the ministerial cabinet, I suffered from this myself. You have very, very short cycles. One cycle uh, chases away the, the next. So we're in the immediate term. We have to live with it. And in any event, we have never so much needed the long term, long term for national policies, for example. I'm thinking about uh, uh, re-establishing proper schools, reducing social inequalities thereby, uh, public finances. And I'm thinking about a few major challenges like the ecological transition. And that obviously calls for long term action. So that's my first point. We have the short, short term and the need for long term. Second point, we absolutely need to have long term prospects. Uh, politicians have always uh, looked at long term uh, perspectives. Uh, it was the year 2000 in the past. I grew up uh, in European affairs uh, and with the idea that Europe would be the most competitive economy by 2020. So it's quite easy to uh, look at the future, to have these great prospects, and that's very useful. But what we need today is action, action which makes it possible to bring about transition in a robust manner. And these transitions are sometimes rather difficult because they entail a cost, you have to give up certain things. However, if we don't uh, take this action, this short-term action, which will enable us to attain our long-term goals, well then, we will end up um, deferring the ecological transition, for example. And the more you delay things, the more it will be difficult, the hotter the climate will get. And if the worst comes to the worst, we'll end up uh, in an irreversible situation. This is perhaps what is already happening in terms of biodiversity. If we fail to act, that entails risks. Action might be even more difficult in the future or might become totally impossible. So we need this uh, short-term action, even if it's difficult, in order to succeed in uh, tracing out these long-term prospects. And also, this action cannot be taken all of a sudden. If the politicians don't manage to engage the population in these, uh, this action, even if it's difficult, then this action may be undone by the next government. It won't be a lasting action, and we'll find ourselves in a situation where social tension, which exists, look at the rioting that we experienced in the last week, social tension may be heightened. So we need not just uh, the long term, but also difficult short term action in order to sketch out these prospects for the future and move forward on the pathway. And to do this, we have to uh, gain the confidence of our citizens, engage them. So that's the topic for this morning. How can we define the idea is not how to define a rosy future, but how to make the future possible. Thank you, Claire.
Thank you for being here. We're very fortunate because in our panel, we have a number of speakers with great experience of public life. They also have experience in private, uh, in the private sector. Companies are being impacted by political uh, decisions. I'll rapidly introduce them. Mr. Uh, uh, Donwai, who's president of COP15, he comes from Cote d'Ivoire. He'll talk about uh, projects and the tension between short and long term. Augustin de Romanet, CEO of uh, Paris Airports, uh, who has great experience in public policy. He worked for the Caisse de Depot and also worked at a very high level in various cabinets. Uh, Stéphane Vallès, who uh, runs the Française des Jeunes, has great experience uh, in the cabinet of Michel Sapin, Jacques Attali, who's a writer, a thinker, and uh, he was a, an advisor to François Mitterrand, and I'm sure you have a great deal to say. And finally, we'll be recompensed for coming here this morning because we have a speaker who wasn't initially planned. We're fortunate to have uh, a minister in charge of transport, Clément Bonne, thank you very much for being with us today. And I imagine that you have to contend with these issues on a daily uh, level. I'll give a short introduction. Uh, Mr. Doyen is going to talk about a, a project he needs to uh, manage, which is the Great Green Wall, to combat uh, desertification. And here this illustrates the tension between short and long term, Mr. Dunway. Thank you. I'd like very quickly. You said I'm president of COP, COP15. I think a lot of people may not know what that is. You have COP27, you have two COP15s, and you have COP27. There are three COPs, in fact, in the world. 30 years ago, at the Rio Convention, we started to talk about climate change. Three COPs were set up, one to deal with climate change, one to deal with the loss of biodiversity, and the third, to talk about uh, uh, drought, uh, desertification, and uh, the impoverishment of, of uh, agricultural land. Desertification and biodiversity meet every two years. That's why they've been 15 for the last 30 years, and you have a COP that meets every year, which is the climate COP, and which now stands at 27 instead of 30, because it uh, stopped for two years owing to COVID. These three COPs uh, work under the aegis of the UN, and we have over 200, 220 countries in the world which are parties to this convention. The COP desertification 15 took place in Cote d'Ivoire. Cote d'Ivoire has a two or two and a half year a term of office to chair COP15 and to ensure that the decisions taken at the convention are implemented by all the countries. I was therefore appointed by the government, by my president as candidate, and I was elected by the various countries. My role is not to defend Africa or the Cote d'Ivoire, but all the countries which are party. Today we're going to talk about Africa because one of the great issues at COP is the Great Green Wall. The Great Green Wall consists in creating a wall of trees spanning 8,000 kilometers but along Senegal uh, up to Ethiopia in order to green the Sahel region and therefore change the economy of these countries, make the desert green again, but also create a, a real economy full of hope for these uh, populations that are now living in a desert or that live uh, near the Sahel. Desertification and drought today are topics that are ever more urgent. They are a fact. Poor countries suffer most from desertification and drought. And even industrialized countries now, for the couple of years, have started to discover what drought is all about. 37 degrees since uh, we've uh, arrived here. That's hotter than in Abidjan. We were at 28 degrees when I left. So imagine drought today is a global issue and people are taking an interest in it. These topics are also in, always interlinked. If there is a drought, there's a loss of biodiversity. If there are no longer any forests, there's biodiversity loss. If the, the, the soil uh, is no longer fertile, uh, that leads to insecurity. 
in Africa, the jihad movement is part and parcel of this phenomenon. And here, drought, heat waves, lack of water, and this is now happening to us. So we have to act, we have to act fast. The green uh, projects that finished by 2030, we have only uh, uh, achieved this project uh, to the tune of 20% for lack of financing. There were a lot of promises that were made by in the industrialized countries uh, in order to finance the Great Green Wall. But what we find today, after 10 years since the inception of the project, only 20% of it has been achieved in the field, uh, in, on the spot that is planting uh, trees, and we've only received 20% of the financing. Why do we have why do we have a problem with financing? It's public financing. It's hard to, to put up the funds. Some institutions spend two or three years before even starting to get financing for a project. And then by the time the financing is obtained, the project has become obsolete. So you have a problem of financing because there's a problem of preparedness at country level preparedness uh, to ensure the projects are profitable. There's a lack of financing for feasibility studies, for example. So when it comes to implementation, we're wasting a lot of time. But we need to act now in terms of desertification and reforestation. If we don't act now, we will uh, waste uh, 40 years. Because if you plant a tree, it's only in 40 years' time that the tree will be effective. And there's a very, very serious risk, therefore. I've always been surprised to see how in all our countries people react quickly, financially speaking, when they are attacked, uh, when there's a problem of security, as we saw recently with Ukraine and Russia. We're capable rapidly in a couple of days or weeks to release uh, vast sums of money. But when you talk about climate, or the risk of drought, when you talk about uh, soil degradation, people don't realize it's a problem of security as well, a security which is even more serious and will become even more serious than war. So we have to act now, release the funds, and change our way of doing things. We need to react now, in other words. Thank you. We'll talk about this later in the debate. The issue of uh, financing embodies the tension between short and long term. Tackling the challenges like climate is one thing. There are other major societal challenges which France and other countries must contend with. The political decisions are often difficult to take, as we know. We have to build uh, decisions in a methodical way. We have to be well informed in order to take the right decisions. And I know that this is a point which uh, Augustin de Romanet think is not properly addressed. <laughs> yes, thank you very much. Good morning, everybody. The subject is reintroducing the long term, which seems to indicate that the long term has disappeared. People are nostalgic of Colbert's uh, forestry policies. Uh, Colbert uh, uh, built forests in order to build ships. There's a nostalgia in terms of General de Gaulle's the nuclear project as well. To reintroduce the long term in public decisions, I'll just limit myself to one thing that was uh, mentioned by Claire. Namely, we need to uh, share the same findings. In our country, we find it difficult to face the truth. And we don't seem to share and agree on the facts. That leads do disorderly action. I experienced this when the National Assembly was dissolved. At the time, I was in charge of the budget, and I saw that France didn't have a pluriannual budget uh, projection. When we had to prepare for the euro, and I asked the budget to uh, give us a pluriannual budget, I was told, no, you, we can't do that because the figures may change, and that will worry the minister. So there were no budgetary projections as a result. I'd like to give you four examples, because I have four minutes. I'll give you two examples of a successful experience and two examples 
of experiences or experiments that failed. Now, in terms of failures, there's a recent example. Look at the uh, pension uh, reform. The uh, uh, retirement council wasn't able to uh, explain things properly. You know, providing stable facts that wouldn't change every six months without being contradicted by this or that person. And the council couldn't look at, at uh, pensions as a whole in France. This created such a, a disorder that, uh, in terms of the findings, that uh, things were applied in a disorderly way. Look at public finances. For years and years, France has failed to honor its uh, engagements, its commitments in terms of uh, public finance. Under Jean Artuis, uh, we proposed uh, to set up an institution that would be totally independent to check the quality of the uh, projections for our public finances. We proposed uh, to uh, calculate the differences. It's one thing to have a project, but then you have to respect them. I won't develop that, but all these proposals were just uh, uh, thrown out. Uh, before the projection by the RTE in October 2021 on the future of energy in France, there was no clear vision of the challenges in terms of developing renewable energies. And also there was no qualification of the fact that we couldn't do without nuclear power. And all observers noted that the existence of this outstanding work done by RTE which wasn't widely publicized. Everyone explained that uh, this was uh, uh, commissioned, but this led uh, to a much uh, calmer action when it came to renewables. Then we have Article 301 of the Climate and Energy uh, Act that uh, forces the air sector to have projections for CO2 emissions by 2030. So we have uh, the IPCC uh, findings, and we have agreed on the fact that by 2050 we have a certain number of efforts to make. And this finding led us to recognize that we do not know how to decarbonize energy with electric or hydrogen uh, or uh, sustainable uh, fuel-powered aircraft. We have to reduce the number of trips. And you need to look at these mathematical equations and share them reach a consensus. That enables us to act. To conclude, because I've already been uh, too lengthy in my statement, and there is reason to hope. When it comes to the climate, or when it comes to energy, or when it comes to investment in the future in France today, we have a long-term approach. Look at France 2030. France 2030 is a program which has identified uh, 10 sectors of the future for the French economy. And currently, when you look at the number of startups emerging in France, beginning with aviation, I won't talk about the uh, future uh, hydrogen fuel jet. These uh, projects are financed by France 2030, which illustrates the fact that when you share the analysis of the existing situation, which calls for a lot of consultation, then you can really do wonderful things. Thank you, Augustin de Romanet. We'll talk about this again when we debate the topic of ecological planning and the need to, to lay down goals and think about the long term. We need to reintroduce the long term. When we prepared this debate, we mentioned the fact we need to be responsible vis-a-vis -vis future generations. Current policy must uh, provide for a, an acceptable uh, quality of living for our children, grandchildren, and future generations. We have to think about youth. Stefan, I know you're very keen on this, uh, particularly in light of recent events. Stefan Palais. Good morning. I share the views of Augustin. We pretty much agree with the diagnosis of the situation. We need to be fairly modest, however, when it comes to the lessons to be learned. I believe we have all been struck by this frustration we all feel 
it's just so difficult to adopt and stick to a long-term vision. I'm not going to talk about recent events in particular. I simply like to talk about a, a study which we conducted among young people, all young people. The following finding was drafted. 76% think the uh, French society is unfair. 61% feel that everything hinges on your social origins. But uh, 76% to trust the future. I think these are quite shocking figures for us all. But this should stimulate us uh, to act. In fact, uh, what are people asking of us? They're not asking us to solve everything uh, right away. They're asking us uh, to have a positive vision of the future in which people feel they can become engaged, uh, project themselves into the future, pursue their career. So it's not a question of planning, it's a question of having a vision. And what is quite striking when it comes to government decisions, as aptly stated at the beginning, there are lots of ways of looking at the long term. It's the government that can focus most on the long term. It can look at uh, uh, perspectives. We have all sorts of bodies that look into the future. Also, the government can uh, engage long-term financing much more than companies. So it's the government that has the uh, most powerful comparative advantage when it comes to envisaging the long term. But not single-handed, but it can act as a sort of a compass for all the players in the economy. That is the democratic challenge mentioned by some speakers yesterday. Everything is constantly being called into question because of the short term. But in fact, uh, uh, the government must focus above all on the long term. I don't want to take uh, too much of your time, but I believe, as Augustin has said, that uh, there are a certain number of examples which show that we can be very pragmatic in the long term. The state can draw inspiration from the way in which uh, uh, companies uh, uh, chart their course. They're not perfect, of course, when it comes to long term. But there are certain avenues which are worth studying. How can one look at the long term in a complex world that's constantly undergoing transformations? I think these avenues can be summed up as, uh, as follows. As Augustin has said, it's necessary to share the data, not necessarily the diagnosis, but you need to share the data because all studies show that people no longer believe in data. They talk about fake news. They don't believe in politicians. They don't believe in economists anymore or journalists. They don't necessarily even believe the media. So even if not everyone is convinced, I think there is a, a huge base there which consists in sharing data, being transparent with data, and if possible, good quality data. I believe that that's a fundamental ingredient. And instead of talking about planning, planning, I think, is a concept which is a bit nostalgic. It hasn't always proved its worth, and it's not very su well suited to today's world. I would rather talk about a vision. How can one develop a vision? How can one develop a vision? How can one measure it as time goes by? You need to conduct a, an evaluation in the intermediate term and adjust this vision, but it shouldn't be called into question all the time. So I'd like to refer to vision above all. I believe we need to agree to say that we don't know everything. There's some things we do not know, and we, these things may modify the trajectory, and we, this calls for a very wide debate. Now, to revert to young people, I think we have to give 
young people, in the meantime, reasons to hope while awaiting to develop this vision. And the results won't be tangible right away. That's one of the difficulties. The only way of developing these reasons for hope is education, training, and employment. And there we can act right away in order to give these reasons to hope uh, in the future. Education will build up trust and will help us to uh, shape this vision of the future. Thank you. You talked about giving reasons to hope, and that is a great source of tension, too. Preparing a more serene future, well, sometimes it's difficult to take short-term decisions we've taken about financing, budgetary choices, which are not always easy to explain and get accepted, even if the decision is well-founded. How, therefore, can one take difficult political decisions in the short term which will be acceptable? How can one make this transition, this process, a desirable? Jacques Atelier, I know you've given considerable thought to the matter. Thank you very much. I took a few notes listening to the outstanding statements just made. What is the long term? Is it five years, ten years? What is it, a hundred years or a thousand, uh, a thousand years? That's an important question. Second comment. We've been thinking about the long term. It's not an economic or a political issue, however. It's a philosophical question above all. Do we attach importance to the long term? Do we consider that the future is important? Or with the tyrannical liberty, uh, freedoms in our society, can we uh, say that the only thing that counts is me and uh, at this very instant? A bit like Marx, Groucho Marx, who said, I don't see why I should take an interest in future generations. Uh, what's the point for me? It's a very deep statement, while at the same time being stupid. I think that we should think above all, uh, we should be aware of the fact that it's in our interest to take care of future generations. We need, rationally speaking, uh, to be altruistic. And that's not an easy finding. We are threatened to disappear. Humanity is under a threat out of ignorance, out of war, the uh, artificialization of the territory, not in two centuries or a thousand years, but much sooner. Therefore, we need uh, to take account of the long term. A lot of species will disappear. Uh, certain species, the uh, platypuses, uh, may disappear soon. And as we've seen here, the climate will become unbearable. Millions of people will have to uh, move. And therefore, it's in our interests uh, to consider the long term out of fear and because we need to, to make the future desirable. Well, to achieve this, we need to be aware of the fact that what we do for our children, i.e. take an interest in their future, well, we have to do this for all the children of the world. And we should consider all the children of the world like our children. Even the children not yet born should be viewed as our children. I think that's a, a, an easy finding. We have to distinguish between a positive and a negative society. A positive society is a society that takes an interest in the future, in the long term, the very long term. A negative society is uh, the society in which we live. We focus solely on the instant, on the stock exchange. People are narcissistic. Uh, there's the populism, uh, ideological relations are very tense. We need to distinguish in the economy between sectors that are useful for the future and sectors that are harmful for the future. Health, education, sustainable mobility, renewable energy, healthy food, democracy, culture, they are useful uh, to the future. Everything else that hinges on oil, uh, disastrous farming, artificial sugars, 
That is the economy of death. The economy of death, that's 60% of the world's economy, over 60% of the consumption of each and every one of us. And if we want to act, we have to shift consumption and focus more on life. It's desirable to take care of health, renewable energy, education, agriculture. There's nothing disastrous in that. It's like what was said. We have to have sustainable uh, transport. We have to avoid uh, this uh, deathly society. And I think we can apply all this concretely in our societies. Things are possible. All we need to do is to slightly modify our constitutions, both in France and elsewhere, to say that any decision that runs against the interests of a future generations is uh, unconstitutional. It's not easy to prove, of course, but at least we will have tried. And each decision taken by a minister or a government or a company will have to justify how it affects future generations, like parents who have to justify what they do and show that it's useful for their children. That, in my view, will make our societies more desirable. And I'd like to add two further comments. First, if in our societies we suffer from the tyranny of the short term and we want to impose the long term, then we have to quickly take decisions which impose the long term. So the long term becomes uh, uh, absolutely necessary, and we can't backtrack on that. And obviously, we also need to be very enthusiastic and as free as possible. We need to uh, think about what Rambo said. A poet is a, a, a soothsayer who can think about uh, what isn't working well in the, in the world. Well, it's a bit uh, hard. I don't know whether you're along the lines of uh, renewing hope, but uh, we will continue. So, uh, Clément Bon, uh, I don't know if you can manage uh, this uh, reality. Uh, recently, we have uh, been uh, having a number of crisis. Uh, recently, we were talking about the stroboscopic impact of uh, what's happening. How can you think of uh, the long term in such an environment and such a context? Well, thank you very much. Uh, to get back to some principles uh, that have been mentioned uh, already, uh, the discussion between short-term, long-term, preparing for the coming centuries is a long-standing discussion. Uh, obviously, uh, what is uh, urgent uh, today is the climate issue. And even though we talk about emergency, we have to have projections uh, over the long term. But this is not a new discussion. The uh, political philosophy, the memoirs of uh, 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 important decision makers over the centuries have shown that. And it's all the more important, all the more uh, topical in a democracy such as uh, ours. Because uh, our democracy, it means constant pressure for uh, acting right away because there's a freedom of choice, which is part of our political regime. But it also means that we have to do this uh, ties up our hands for the future. And I would like to, uh, in fact, picking up on what uh, my neighbor just said, we should not idealize uh, long term uh, uh, and consider that it's 100% uh, uh, the right decision. Uh, uh, someone said uh, democracy is uh, has a part of void. Uh, we always have to make a choice. And if we say that for the next two centuries, we have set in stone and all our uh, political choices, obviously I'm exaggerating, there would be no more political choice because it means that every four, five, six, seven years we can't uh, challenge uh, our choices. And the idea of a democracy is being able to challenge regularly our uh, collective choices. 
And uh, I know that in France, uh, we are uh, very much interested in the long-term visions. Uh, Augustin de Romanet was talking about uh, the long-term plans, like uh, the France uh, 2030, or if I think of the TGV plan or the railway plan. We seem to love these long-term visions, and we tend to judge our politicians based on their ability to propose this vision. But we are also in one of the democracies of the Western world where the uh, daily action is probably the most violent uh, and leading the other way. So the tools we have to reconcile both sides uh, are not new. We have a constitution that gives us some stability for daily life. There is the uh, European project uh, presented by Claire Vaison, and we've worked a lot together. And since the beginning, uh, the creation of Europe was aimed at creating uh, 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 slow processes. We decided that we would have a complex collective and longer term deliberations. And that's the whole point of Europe. This is why in times of crisis, we say, well, what about Europe? How come it cannot decide uh, in two hours on an emergency plan? In fact, we've seen that we can do it, but there's this constant uh, balancing between having the rules, the independent authorities that uh, uh, purposely work uh, at a slow pace and the need to, to accelerate at some points. And the world does not understand why uh, the uh, it is not possible to accelerate and make an immediate uh, decision. So uh, whether you're in 2020, 1950, or in the previous uh, centuries, uh, this may not be so different. But we have two new elements which are weighing heavily. First of all, climate change, which prevent us from uh, uh, working fast and uh, making projections. And obviously, at environmental level, if you want to be efficient by 2050, you want to have carbon neutrality, you have to have a cleaner uh, car, you, you must have uh, uh, modal uh, changes in the railway system. And uh, we have a new element uh, which is difficult to materialize, but which is a must for uh, political authorities, but which have to be combined uh, with uh, the long term. And uh, this is what I sometimes call the, strobo the political stroboscope. You have more and more permanent uh, signals which are flashes that are blinding you and that may not be working at a uh, weekly or monthly pace, but at an hourly one. So obviously, it's very difficult for political authorities to get rid of these emergency elements. But you don't have to spend all your time on Twitter or uh, looking at uh, things constantly. It's important to have a, a, a feeling of nuance in long term. Uh, there are no institutions uh, replacing these personal and collective ethics. Uh, you have to get rid of that. And uh, as I uh, say, uh, to we, we could take the example of climate or apply it to, uh, to other areas. Uh, you also have to find some tricks to uh, combine uh, long-term and short-term. I'm not saying it's something new, but it's even more true nowadays. If you take the environmental issue, what are uh, the uh, uh, most powerful decisions we made uh, over the, uh, the environmental issues recently in terms for we forbid uh, we said that uh, by uh, 2035, uh, uh, some cars could not be sold anymore, these thermal engines. Uh, so I'm not saying it's the right choice or the wrong choice, but we've made a choice for all our countries, which has a high economic impact in the end. Is that very visible in, uh, for our uh, citizens? People know it, they're worried about it, but I'm not sure they consider it as a major ecological uh, measure. In fact, uh, uh, the uh, private jets uh, uh, that uh, Augusta have uh, mentioned, the movements of our uh, soccer players, the uh, all this uh, uh, 
and uh, our daily moves, uh, all that uh, means decisions being made uh, every... Uh, and if you do not make a decision and if... Uh, if you do not give an orientation that will be represented by a longer term decision later on, you will not manage it. And if I may take a very uh, trivial example, when you say you have to invest in railway for uh, environmental issues, okay. But when you have a new railway line, when you buy trains or you re renovate the network, it takes about 15 or uh, 10, 15 years if you want to tell that uh, to people who haven't got a regular trains. Uh, uh, and uh, if you want to tell them it's going to happen, it's going to uh, end up with a, a few issues. Uh, there's a, a railway line that I like very much, which is that between Paris and Clermont-Ferrand, which is underinvested. We've taken a number of elected authorities and associations to go and see the new train which is being manufactured. It may sound ridiculous, but it's extremely important to illustrate change in directions. So if we want to articulate uh, long term and short term, we have to make sure that we're consistent and we have to make people see what's going to happen tomorrow. And this is uh, what the, the whole topic of the day is, uh, meaning renewing hope. I believe there's a way of connecting short term and long term. It's not a new discussion, but between the stroboscopic effect, the flash is blinding you and the need to uh, have some planning, especially on the climate issue. It's important to have an illustration that uh, we're doing both at the same time. Thank you. I could see, Jacques Attali, that you had a question. I'll give you the floor in a minute, but uh, I wanted to get back to this uh, ecological planning process. Uh, this is the very example of a process that was uh, built uh, to uh, think over the long term. There are a lot of expectations uh, uh, for this process. We're waiting uh, for some uh, arbitrations to be made uh, after uh, July 14th. And uh, this uh, decarbonation has to be funded. Uh, Jean Pisani Ferro, in his report, uh, said that we would need an additional 34 billion additional uh, uh, euros of public funds uh, by uh, 2030. The government added uh, seven, uh, said that they would add seven billion uh, in 2024, so there's money uh, missing somewhere. Well, I'm not going to tell you about the budget, but I would like to even worsen the diagnosis because Jean Pisani Ferry even mentions uh, uh, higher amounts than the 34 billion you just mentioned. I believe that the minister mentioned five additional billion for next year, uh, saying that we were going to inject uh, an additional seven billion per year in the ecological uh, transition. I'm not going to make a list, the green fund, uh, the environmental part of transportation, etc. So uh, this comes uh, in addition to what is being done locally in the various areas or uh, in what uh, other companies do, do public uh, companies uh, like uh, the SNC of the French Railway or the Aéroport de Paris, which is partly public. So uh, after July 14th, we'll be able to present uh, the uh, ecological or environmental uh, uh, approach. I can tell you that we've worked on it on a sector by sector basis, transportation, agriculture. We are going to announce a number of uh, actions. But uh, as you can see, even though we have a holistic approach, we'll have to materialize uh, and uh, uh, implement in practice a number of changes. Uh, and if you don't explain to people that what you're doing is serious, if you don't explain what's going to happen, that you're really investing in the railway, in housing, etc., if they don't see it now, they don't believe it will happen tomorrow. And this is nothing new, but even more in our present society. Jacques Attali, you wanted to react uh, to what uh, uh, your neighbor said. Well, as he uh, m talked about me uh, saying my neighbor, he contradicted me and I disagree with him. 
First of all, he has uh, lots of illusions about the role of politicians. They have less and less power. There's the market, centralization, independent authorities. And we have uh, two highly respectable ones that are represented here by their bosses in this room. But uh, the politics have uh, less and less power. In fact, I must uh, say, dear neighbor, dear friend, that I was shocked when you said that, uh, that uh, the uh, 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 power is free to do what they want and that uh, they must uh, preserve their freedom. I would say no, no, because there's a constitution, there are principles, there are values. We have to keep voting rights for the future generations, and we're responsible for thinking about them, which is why I said that we have to, uh, by way, in my preliminary remarks, that we have to give a voting rights to future generations. But we have to explain uh, that uh, you don't, you shouldn't choose anything anytime, but you have to decide on the speed at which you're going to do things, which is why I think that the, the report of our uh, friend uh, Pisani Ferry is absurd. We don't need an additional uh, 35 billion euros of investment. We need to shift uh, money from a death economy to a life economy. And we have to say that everything we do to support fossil fuels, uh, fossil transport, unhealthy agriculture, all that represents 50% uh, of the GDP and which represent the death economy, we should stop subsidizing that, and if we shift that, we have enough money to... Uh, second mistake, well, let's let the minister answer. Okay, let me finish and he can answer that. Uh, let uh, me hear about the second mistake. The second mistake would be to think that climate is the only problem, the only issue, even if we had uh, a lot of money to put into climate, but we don't do anything about uh, education, health, or other, the planet will be lost. So we have to think of all the sectors together, not only ecology in per se. Well, one second. Uh, it may be my consensual nature or because uh, I believe that uh, we're more in agreement than I may have said, uh, may have uh, given you to think. I didn't say we didn't have to have any rules, institution or higher standard that should integrate the long term. All the reverse, in fact. Uh, you are saying there's not enough power for pol uh, politicians or no, I'm saying that uh, politicians have to accept that they have less and less. Yes, because there are a number of rules, uh, for example, with independent administrative authorities. I don't know if we can uh, uh, think that the, I saw that the governor of uh, Banque de France is here. He has reduced part of the political authority. Uh, I'm not unfavorable to that, but uh, it's not new, and secondly, there's a balance. Uh, uh, no one uh, would suggest for the law to do everything and to get rid of constitution. It's a balance between principles, values, long-term strategies, uh, where we uh, voluntarily uh, or willfully tie up our hands and an approach of uh, uh, value. This is absolutely basic. I believe that it's difficult when you have challenges, and uh, climate is not the only one. Challenges that mean that you have to review the balance. Uh, uh, not uh, uh, getting, uh, we shouldn't uh, get rid of uh, pub uh, regular uh, public decisions uh, like elections. I say that elections uh, can uh, challenge even a uh, climate strategy. It, this is about uh, a democratic freedom. If we uh, want to act, uh, we should manage uh, to uh, get people to move through symbols and uh, lead them uh, through the longer term because uh, of uh, uh, that we need uh, them to buy into what we do.
Augustin de Romanet, I saw you smiling or nodding uh, your approval or not. I'm going to reconcile Clément Bonne and uh, uh, Jacques Attali by giving uh, the floor to uh, my uh, neighbor, uh, Alain Richard de Wally. Why? Because uh, you can go through international treaties. Democracies change every five years. Uh, for a regime uh, to uh, challenge uh, uh, an international treaty, it must uh, uh, go uh, beyond the mandate uh, given by the uh, citizens. Uh, and uh, let me uh, give the floor to Alain uh, uh, Richard Donnoy uh, to reconcile the two viewpoints. I'm not sure I can reconcile. In fact, I don't think uh, both uh, have opposite views. Uh, no, no, we're just debating to to animate the, the discussion. I'm not going to enter into a French discussion. I come from Côte d'Ivoire. I believe we must all have objectives and goals, and these objectives uh, define our present action and our uh, politics. Uh, uh, I'm an elected authority. I've been so for 20 years. I've been the president of a region for 10 years. What is important to me is what is good for my community, for the community in general. We need more involvement of the populations. Uh, and this is what will get things to change. I agree to say that political authorities have less and less power, but their power comes uh, the, from uh, the people, and the people is the one that must sanction. But if the people are not informed, the populations are not made aware of what is good for them for tomorrow, then they're not going to exert pressure on uh, the political uh, decision makers. And we, uh, political decision makers, should not make decisions in our uh, air-conditioned uh, offices in uh, Côte d'Ivoire uh, and not do what is good for our populations, which is why I agree to say that the idea is not to spend uh, more, but uh, to know how to allocate uh, the investments uh, and, put the, and spend the money where it should be spent. We need to have the means, and we need to involve the private sector more and more. Do not just count on public policies or public fundings. The private sector must be much more involved. Our youth should be more involved. Women, we've also talked about it earlier. Uh, but uh, I would say youth in general. Youth must be more involved, not only in private action, but also in political discussions. Thank you. Let me keep uh, two minutes for questions from the audience. Unless, uh, Stéphane Palais, you want to add something? Yes. I wanted to say something about what was said about the reconciling uh, the uh, long and short term. Obviously, making a positive decision over the short term or showing something that illustrates the future and enables uh, us to wait until things come into fruition is all very well. But apart from that, uh, there are short-term decisions that should not be made, or some things should be sort of said, sort of uh, cleaned up to make sure that we're being consistent. For example, we were talking about biodiversity, uh, uh, pesticides. It's difficult to say we have a clear uh, uh, track. Uh, we're going to take care of biodiversity, which is a topic that citizens uh, are really buying into, which is very popular, and not sure that over the short term we are being consistent. So this should be added to the uh, list of uh, means to reconcile the short and long term. I'm not going to open the discussion on uh, the banning of pesticides, but we have some questions. Uh, questions here. Do you have any microphones for the audience? 
Hello, everyone, and thank you for being here so early. And thank, I would like to thank the organizers for the, uh, organizing this session because uh, uh, the economic issue is mainly political. Mr. Uh, Bourne, uh, without uh, uh, discrimination, uh, 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 we know, uh, Minister, that your heart is on the left, uh, at least since 2012. In view of your experience, don't you think that this session should be called introducing long-term in uh, political decision without going back to Aristoteles or others? To me, the answer is obvious. Uh, it seems that the political time is only short-term. And what is your question, sir? I think uh, the title of this session, don't you think uh, it should be introducing and not reintroducing? Clément Boone, don't you do any long-term, uh, don't you make any long-term decisions today? Well, if what you mean is that we're not taking into account the long-term in political and private strategies, it's not true. We have all tools, we should could uh, mention uh, uh, infrastructures, Augustin Romanet could tell you about it, but I believe that we're even blinder than in the previous uh, uh, times. There is a, Now we're in times of immediacy more than ever, and we should uh, act more uh, and uh, in, uh, explain in our political speeches that we're thinking about tomorrow and the day after and not just about present crisis. Uh, thank you, the gentleman with a good uh, uh, with your fan. You have a good strategy to to attract attention with your fan. Uh, yeah, it's the technique of uh, fruit trees. You have to put in color to attract uh, birds. Mr. Roman de Romanet, you said that technically it wasn't possible to support the growth of. Uh, uh, global traffic. I would like to hear the various speakers to explain how we can bring this sobriety into our present times in practice. A question to Mr. de Romanet, but uh, I believe that it's a question for... Uh, I believe that Augustin de Romanet did say that you need a number of actions uh, to limit uh, traffic and restrict traffic, uh, I do agree. And this is the very articulation between the short, medium, and long term. In one word, I believe that uh, we can have uh, an aviation industry or aviation sector that is uh, very little carbonated, not to say decarbonated, full, uh, but everybody says, uh, all the specialists, airport specialists, uh, say that we won't have low carbon and no carbon tr and planes by before 10, 20, or, uh, or 20 years. Uh, you have a, a number of... Uh, I don't think you could uh, decide on the number of flights you can take over your life, but uh, closing up a number of airway lines, as we've already done, rethinking a number of activities is not a sanction, as we're saying sometimes, but it's a, a requirement to encourage people to behave differently, and it's also a way of uh, uh, showing that there are solutions that are different uh, uh, over the short term and the long term, and that technically we have to uh, show our action. Thank you very much for your presence, and I would like to thank all the speakers for this very animated discussion.
Merci. Merci d'être avec nous. Oui. Bonjour à tous. Merci. Good morning, everyone. Thank you for being with us this morning for this session. I'd like warmly to thank you all for being here on a Sunday morning to France Télévision. And I'm very pleased uh, to uh, moderate this uh, round table. We have a prestigious panel made up of uh, governors of central banks, and we're going to try and answer this essential question about central banks. Are central banks good lightning rods in a time of crisis? Can they manage to neutralize uh, existing crises and also perhaps uh, prevent uh, risks in the future? So we have with us, uh, in order from left to right, Jean-Paul Poulin, who is a member of the Cercle des Economies, Jean-Paul Poulin, Andrew Bailey, Governor of the uh, Bank of England, Pablo Hernández de Cos, Governor of the Bank of Spain, Mario Centeno, Governor of the Bank of Portugal, Naoko Ishii, professor at the University of Tokyo, who has also been Vice Minister of Finance, François Mille Villeroy de Gallo, Governor of the Bank of France. And I give the floor right away to Jean-Paul Paulin. Thank you. The lightning rod was invented to try and neutralize shocks severe atmospheric shocks. Central banks were created to regulate finance, to avoid uh, bank runs, for example, and also to uh, uh, ward off uh, budgetary shocks often linked to war. In the last 15 years, central banks have uh, uh, gone back to their original mission. They've intervened in two types of crises, the financial crisis in 2008 on the one hand and the health crisis in 2020. Did they neutralize the impact of these crises? We could say that they probably made it possible to ensure that the crises are less catastrophic than they would have been otherwise, but they didn't really neutralize the crisis because in the end there was a strong increase in the uh, state indebtedness. Budgetary policies were exaggeratedly laxist. Furthermore, there was a collapse in growth rates initially. There was inflation and an increase in interest rates. And then, of course, inflation came back. So one can wonder, what we need to ask the central banks is perhaps to ward off storms. In other words, to prevent a certain number of risks. Obviously, they do this because they regulate and supervise uh, banks. And this mission was accentuated by the 2008 crisis, fortunately. However, a lot still remains to be done, particularly when it comes to shadow banking. This mission is therefore very clear. One must say, however, that it's not all that evident to stabilize prices while at the same time achieving financial stability. For example, if you want to relaunch the economy with overly low interest rates, then studies have shown that if you keep interest rates too low for too long, that leads to an increase in the probability of a crisis. But it should be possible. Uh, recently, central banks have been deeply concerned by the uh, risk of climate change. They want to intervene in the prevention 
of these risks. There again, they can do so through different kinds of action. In particular, central banks can improve the terms of financing for green investment. That might appear as a way of uh, pushing aside their basic uh, uh, principle, i.e. Uh, being neutral on the market. Some central banks have also talked about preventing the risk linked to inequalities of income and wealth. That's an awful lot of goals at the same time, no doubt. We should ask ourselves whether these new goals are not too numerous. When there was great moderation in the 90s, the central banks restricted their goals, and now, today, they are expanding the scope of their goals. Is that possible? That will no doubt be one of the questions which this exceptional panel will try to answer. Thank you, Jean-Paul. Thank you. We have the same first name. Thank you for keeping to your speaking time, which is quite limited for each speaker, five minutes, and obviously we will then hold a debate with the room. People in the room can uh, listen to the simultaneous interpretation, channel two in English, channel one in French, because our speakers will speak different languages. I'll give the floor to Andrew Bailey for five minutes. Well, thank you. And can I start by saying what a pleasure it is to be here at uh, Les Recontra. I've heard a lot about it, never actually had the chance to experience it, and it's been a real pleasure to be here and to be here in Aix. So thank you for inviting me to start with. I'm going to start by just developing the sort of the lightning rod um, metaphor, if you don't mind, for a moment, because I do think it's important to bear in mind that lightning rods only solve one problem. They don't solve every problem um, <laughs> that comes along. You know, they were designed, invented, and built to solve one problem, um, and they seem to do that pretty effectively, as far as I can tell, although fortunately I've never had to uh, have the experience. And I think that's important because... As the, you, know, you rightly both said in the introduction, there are, of course, a lot of shocks going on in the world. And you know, I would observe that I think at the moment we are in a world where there is a confluence, a coming together of more big shocks than we've seen actually for quite a long time in the world economy. But I think it's very important to bear in mind that central banks are here, in our, well, most of us, certainly in the case of the Bank of England, with two objectives. Monetary stability, low inflation, price stability, and financial stability. Those are our objectives. We don't have other objectives. So my starting point is that these other things that are going on, we are not here, I'm afraid, to take the lead in solving them. That, that's not what central banks are here for. That's a starting point. There is a however, because, of course, these shocks do affect. They have an effect on the things that we are here to do on price stability, on financial stability. So we can't ignore them. That would be you know, a very serious mistake on our part if we ignored them. We have to take them into consideration, but I, I'm you know, very, very strict on this. Insofar as central banks take them into consideration, it is because of their influence on our core objectives, not because we are going to take the lead in solving these issues as matters of public policy. And I think that's a, a very important you know, principle, certainly for me, that we, we stick to. But it does mean, at the moment, that we are having to, in a sense, take into account, assess, and respond to a lot more shocks. And, and I just want to finish by really putting them into two categories. There are what I call the long-term shocks. These are things that have been going on for some time, uh, quite a few years now, along, and are going to go on. And I, I'll, I'll identify two. One is an aging population in the world, worldwide. Two, for most of us, very low productivity growth since the financial crisis. I think we understand the first one better than the second one in terms of its causes and how it comes about. And then let me finish by saying there are, of course, 
what we hope and pray will be shorter term shocks. We don't know, but we, we do that. The war in Ukraine, obviously, COVID, which let's hope we're behind now. These are the things that have come along in the last you know, three or four years, have been huge shocks in our world. We can't solve them, sadly, on our course on our own, but we have to take them into account. So I hope that gives a sense, certainly from the Bank of England's perspective, about how we think about these shocks and how we think about our remit. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, now we'll have uh, the uh, Bank of Spain, Pablo Hernandez de Cos. We're here. Well, my, my main point uh, would be, okay, yes, true. Um, monetary policy, uh, central banks have been able to fight uh, against very diverse crises during the last uh, 15 years. Um, but uh, the point I wanted to, to make uh, and to stress is whether we can reach a better uh, balance and a combination of policies to fight against crisis with the help not, uh, of not having only monetary policy as the only game in town, as Francois usually like to, to say, but also other uh, tools, in particular fiscal uh, policy and even uh, macro prudential uh, policy. Um, and let me start with the first one, no? with uh, fiscal policy. Um, in Europe, we've been discussing of uh, the need of uh, having prudent fiscal policy for many, many years, which is, of course, very important for the stability of the European Monetary Union. But uh, sometimes we forget that one of the main reasons why we've always emphasized that this is absolutely crucial is precisely in order to avoid procyclical uh, fiscal policies, which is, by the way, what has been happening for many, many years since the, cre since the creation of the European Monetary Union, meaning that governments uh, were unable to control deficits uh, in the booming periods, and then, of course, when the crisis arrived, they uh, were obliged, to a certain extent, to restrain uh, fiscal policy and to fight, let's say, in the opposite direction that monetary policy was, uh, was doing. And this is why it's so important uh, not only for sustainability reasons, of course, uh, which is uh, the obvious uh, argument, but also to guarantee that fiscal policy is in a position to help monetary policy in the fight against uh, uh, economic crisis, that uh, um, fiscal policy is run in a, in, a prudent, in a prudent manner. And then we can discuss at some point uh, what this implies in terms of the uh, stability and growth pact, but I think the, the message is, is, is clear. And then a second tool, which uh, I mean is a, a more uh, new tool, which is macroprudential policy, so the capacity of uh, central banks uh, or uh, financial authorities more in general to set uh, uh, capital requirements, for example, or borrower-based measures um, during the, the booming periods uh, in the positive territory. Of course, the main argument to do so is to try precisely to fight against uh, the, the financial uh, cycle to emerge. In, the, in this booming period, but there is even a more important argument because probably is the one that uh, we are uh, sure that uh, it helps, is that uh, when the bust uh, comes, also these capital requirements can be used uh, in order precisely to avoid uh, an, uh, uh, too uh, much uh, uh, tightening of, uh, of credit, uh, of credit uh, restraint. So, uh, my main point, okay, yes, monetary policy has had and will have for sure the capacity uh, to fight and to stabilize the economy during crisis, but it will be uh, more optimal to do so in combination with other uh, economic tools and in particular with fiscal policy on the one hand and also with uh, financial uh, stability tools on the other. Merci d'avoir... Thank you very much for keeping to your allotted time. I will now give the floor to Mario Centeno, the uh, governor of uh, the Bank of Portugal. Mario Centeno. Thank you for having me here. I will offer you uh, in my five minutes uh, some reasons uh, for being hopeful about Europe these days. Let's see if I can do it. This will be a very pro-European statement in any case. All crises play out differently. Even if we identify the shocks, the reasons for the crisis, they all play out different. And why is that? Because they play um, through incentives, through our institutions. 
This time around, Europe is the biggest provider of stability in the world in economic policy terms. This is my view. And why is that? Because we prepared ourselves much better this time for the crisis than before. If you go back to 2019, we had 14 out of the 19 member states of the Eurozone in what we call the medium-term objective for fiscal policy, meaning that we were building on reserves, reducing risks in Europe before the crisis. We had the better response to the crisis in the world world in 2020. We actually felt like a heap of integration, maybe the largest jump in integration in Europe during the crisis, because for the first time, as Pablo was mentioning, monetary and fiscal policy played together in Europe. This was not true before in the, in the previous crisis. So Europe has a lot of strengths today, and Europe must know how to use these strengths in the world. This is, this is my first message to you. Well, the current challenges require multiple policy instruments. That's true. We cannot play only with monetary policy or with fiscal policy or regulatory policy and in any case. We need to continue building the European Union. We need a central fiscal capacity for Europe. We need more and better integration. We need to complete the banking union. We still are not there yet. We need a, an European deposit insurance scheme that works for us, works for financial stability in Europe. Other monetary unions have their own schemes. We do need one in Europe as well. And this needs trust. And Europeans need to trust each other. We need to work as a union. We are in the home of rugby uh, in, uh, in Europe. And we all know that an, uh, a monetary union plays out pretty much as a rugby team does. We need to move together in the field, all together. We cannot play with one man down because a rugby team suffers a lot when it plays with one man down. This is the same thing in a monetary union. So we need really to play, to play together. Inflation is a collective bet. It's bad for the economy. That's why central banks have a very strong mandate to promote price stability. It's not for no reason. It's because inflation is bad. We need to fight inflation. And we need all policies to work together. Expansionary fiscal policy in the present will be bad to fight and com combat inflation. We need counter-cyclical policies in that vein. But we do know that monetary policy uh, promotes a redistribution of wealth that do not favor the most vulnerable in our societies. So fiscal policy must be targeted to the most vulnerable and leave aside monetary policy to fight in a, at a macro level uh, inflation. European governments during the COVID and energy crisis played much better than before. There is no existential crisis for the euro for the first time this century in a moment of crisis. This is completely different from before. We need to take this very, very seriously. I can give you only one Merci. number and I'm, and, and I'm finished. Damo. Hmm? Merci. <laughs> Excuse me. During this crisis in 2021 and 22, the US government deficit was 17 percentage points, $3.5 trillion more than the European taken together. This means that even fiscal policy this time in Europe played very well. Thank you. Thank you.
Koichi, you now have the floor. To everyone, I should say that I'm very happy to be here, but the reality is that I feel quite awkward just sitting next to those deputable governors, central bank governors, that then, uh, I have never really worked for the central bank. I actually started my career with the Ministry of Finance, working for IMF and the World Bank. But in the last 10 years, the, while the, the, the world wake up for the environmental crisis, climate crisis, nature loss crisis, I was heading that the GEF, Global Environment Facility in Washington, it's an international uh, institution, and I have been observing what the role of the central bank is, uh, is being played. I was quite impressed that uh, with those new challenges, the environmental, actually the economic system challenges, uh, central banks are moving quite swiftly to take on this new challenge um, because they do understand it will really have a significant impact of the two of your core mandate, price stability as well as the uh, financial system stability. And sitting from the GEF, Global Environment Facility point of view, this is not just the energy crisis, it's not just the environmental crisis, it is the system collision between current economic system, which is still very much fossil fuel based, and it's very linear, it's very linear um, uh, production and consumption system, which does collide with the capacity of a planetary Earth system. So what we are facing is a system collision between current economic system and the planetary Earth system, to solve this, we have to have a green transformation. It's not just the energy transition, transition, it's really economic system transition. And the financial system can play, should play and can play a very, very significant role in it. And that's, I, I see that then the central bank groups that are doing for the past decade or so, leading to NGFS and uh, also the, um, establishing a lot of tool kit to do work on that, so that I'm quite uh, pleased and impressed and really and uh, wholeheartedly appreciated those central bank governors who are courageously stepping outside their original core mandate but taking on the new mandate. It's not new mandate, in my view. If you do help this green transition not that, uh, uh, and somehow find a way to make this transition effective and helpful, beneficial to, to all, you actually, we all actually get much better pricing and much better quality, uh, quality of growth and much better com uh, the, the, um, economy. So it actually falls into that then you are called a mandate of price and financial system stability, but it needs that we, you, we need to really work together to how to find this an effective uh, green transformation pathway together uh, to fit financial system uh, can play a good, uh, important role. I would say that in the for short term, yes, we see a lot of volatility and the challenge. In the medium term, maybe we see that the cost, uh, the price may increase and uh, uh, because the transformation is such a massive, gigantic, and complex that then, uh, uh, challenge, and we never really done it in the, in the past. But if we are able to do it together, it will lead to better price, lower price, that then a better productivity, higher cost of um, uh, 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 quality of life. So I think that we should be all in together to find out that then this green transition and that, that would be really helpful to, to, to us all. And again, the central bank together with that and the financial system as a, as a whole should be able to find out how to flow this and the funds for green transformation at a reasonable uh, cost. Because right now we are mostly talking in Europe, among Europe, for Europe, but the green transformation cannot only take place in Europe. It has to have the all over the world, how to handle the global south issue. And I was there in two weeks ago in Paris on the Macron summit, that then saw how to handle this and the, the green transformation, the outside, this advanced economy, will actually haunt us very significantly uh, either through production, the price, or actually the social equality issue. So that's uh, maybe uh, another challenge we are facing. Thank you. Merci bien.
François Villeroy de Gallo, gouverneur de la Banque de France. Euh, merci Jean. Thank you, Jean-Paul, and hello, everyone. I have a personal message for my friends and colleagues. I would like to tell them how happy I am to see them in France. Believe me, we spend a lot of time together, including uh, at weekends. Two weeks ago, on a Sunday at 10, we were together in a Basel uh, meeting room. It's even nicer to be here in Aix-en-Provence with the cicada singing. Welcome, my friends. The question that is asked from us is, uh, can uh, central banks act as uh, uh, the lightning rod for crisis? I hope I won't shock you by saying no. Uh, of course, we're going to uh, uh, carry out our mission. One word. We are going to bring back inflation towards 2% uh, by 2025 in the Eurozone and in France. In France, we have passed uh, the peak of inflation. Let me give you the figures. 7% uh, at the beginning of the year, 5.3 now with the harmonized uh, European figure. So I believe that we're going to reach the high point, uh, the peak of interest rate uh, in Europe. Or, or rather, when I talk about a high point, it's not so much a peak as a plateau where we will have to stay sufficiently long to make sure of the full integration of the impacts of the monetary policy. Still talking about that, I heard yesterday that we should change our inflationary target and move it not to from to two percent but to three percent. I think this is the very example of a false good idea. But Jean Paul will come back to that. Why am I saying no as an answer to this question about the lightning rod? No, because we can't do everything, as uh, uh, Pablo has said about the various policies. We cannot uh, by ourselves uh, solve the debt crisis or solve the climate crisis, even though all of us here are uh, engaged and committed to uh, uh, the uh, uh, financial system. Uh, now, Co has mentioned the NGFS, Network for Greening the Financial System. It's a network uh, where, uh, which is headed by the uh, Bank of England and French one. Why uh, do I say no? Why do people think that central banks can solve everything? Let me spend the three or four minutes that are left to me, or two minutes I have apparently, only two minutes. Two bad reasons, it seems, and two more interesting reasons uh, for our democratic debate. First bad reason is the illusion that we have a magic wand. Finance is something complicated. Monetary policy people seem to think that it's very austere, very secret, that we have our own non-painful non or unpainful recipes, but no. There is no free lunch, I said in English. We have no power to solve the crisis without any pain. So, second more subtle reason is independence. I do believe in independence. The Banque de France, uh, uh, I would like to say, is celebrating its uh, 30th uh, year of independence, the law of August uh, 93. But to think that we have the privilege of escaping the heavy politics and we have a key, I disagree. Uh, and uh, this leads me to the two more interesting causes. First of all, in our limited uh, scope, we have a clear responsibility. We have a specific ex ante objective, price stability, and we gave you a metric, 2% inflation in the medium term. And we have ex post a measurable result. You know the famous sentence by Albert Camus, ill naming an object means adding to the unhappiness in this world. 
I believe that the public debate is suffering a lot from objectives that are ill-named or ill-metered objectives that are always taking over from the measurement over the measurement of exposed results. And in our limited scope, and this is the second interesting point, we have an ability to act. We have means to reach our results because we have instruments, mainly the interest rate. We have uh, time, not indefinitely, but we were talking about the previous panel. And uh, we have this uh, cooperation, uh, cross-border cooperation, a trusted dialogue between us. We escape the very large difficulty of political authorities, like the piling up of competencies, especially in France, and the tyranny of immediacy. So let me get back to renewing hope. These two modest elements I mentioned, i.e. a clear responsibility and an ability to act, I put them face to face with the intervention of Edouard Philippe yesterday about uh, the democratic fight we had to lead, lead. What can we do? It's not only up to political authorities or others. How can we make sure and how can we ask for public debate that leads people to have responsibility for their results and that gives our elected authorities the ability to act? And I'll stop at that. Thank you. It's true. You have uh, teased somewhat or uh, talked about my second question because uh, here in the Cirque des Economies, we've heard this idea which is no longer taboo, this uh, idea of uh, uh, the target for inflation. We reassured us, you, you said that inflation should get back to 2% by 2025, but at what cost? Is it at the cost of a recession or a very low growth? Then it's not a good thing. And why 2%? Uh, did you just uh, pick it uh, like that, or is it a magic formula? Well, as I said, there's no magic wand. There's no magic formula either. But in our uh, provision, predictions, or uh, we come back to 2% inflation without recession, without external shock. Huh? So why change? Uh, why do I feel that uh, uh, rising this target would be a false good idea? Some people think that if we had a higher target, we wouldn't have to raise uh, the interest rates uh, as much. Well, what would happen would be the exact reverse. If we were to say that we no longer have 2% but 3% uh, in, uh, uh, as a target, right away the promoters would ask for a higher interest rate. At, uh, well, X is great, huh? because not only we have the cicadas, but you also have uh, people applauding uh, the figures of inflation. That is very rare, very scarce. Let's, <laughs> let's stay with this applause. OK, so if uh, you're a lender, and uh, you are if you have a life insurance, uh, if uh, you told uh, that there will be, uh, uh, you can have uh, one additional percent of interest, uh, but that would be a mistake because we would introduce uncertainty about inflation. We would have changed our objective, changed our goal, and we would lose our credibility. And this can be measured on a financial market. If you have more environmental inflation, you have a risk premium. You increase by 1% to compensate for the nominal change in the uh, inflation target, but you increase by more uh, de facto because you create uncertainty. Let me uh, give you a very simple topical uh, uh, talk. Uh, for my non-French colleagues, we have a very a major event in France, the Tour de France, uh, the cycle tour of France. You get to the top of the Puy Dome, which is a mountain in the center of France. Suppose the organizers said, no, we change. The people will not, the arrival will not be at the top of the mountain, but at the bottom. They would lose credibility. Well, the same thing for us. Our commitment is 2%. Okay, then, as we have 
a panel of uh, prestigious governors who wants uh, to disagree with Francois. Andrew Bailey, you wanted to disagree or you want to give us uh, your opinion? With them, actually. But look, I, I, I just want to come back, to, let's come back to this 2% point for a moment. What is 2%? It's actually the practical application of price stability. Now, why 2%? Well, there isn't a great magic, but there is an important point in it. It's low enough that people do not feel they have to factor in what inflation is going to be, what they think inflation is going to be, to their everyday economic decisions. They can put that to one side. But it's not zero, because if it's zero, there's no scope for relative prices to change. And relative prices must change in a flexible economy. So it's a good, it's a good balance between those two things. And I strongly agree with Francois. If we change it, we will unpick not only that definition, we will unpick expectations. And let me add one final point about the current situation. Francois is absolutely right. We have the same issue in the UK. We have it, you know, sadly, somewhat more severely in the UK. We've got to and will bring inflation back to our 2% target. We'll do it, I think, within about the same time frame that Francois was talking about. We do have some flexibility, therefore, about you know, how quickly we bring inflation back to target. But it's absolutely critical that you know, that, that flexibility isn't confused with people thinking, well, they're not pursuing 2% anymore, because we are. So it's, to my mind, it is absolutely critical always, but particularly at the moment, that we emphasize 2%. Thank you. Pablo no, three, three, very, three very quick uh, points. Um, first, uh, the number 2% was not uh, chosen by chance. So back in 1999, and uh, again in 2021, when the ECB uh, uh, perform, uh, develop its uh, strategy review, there, there was a good discussion of uh, higher numbers and lower numbers, okay? And uh, those numbers were confronted in terms of the cost of higher inflation or the cost of lower uh, inflation. And uh, the 2% number was chosen precisely because it was perceived as the optimal one uh, according uh, to, to the empirical and theoretical literature that we uh, have, uh, not only in 1999, but also in 2021, first point. Second, changing um, the objective when inflation is very high and you might be starting to have some credibility problems on your capacity of reaching that number is not a good idea. That's absolutely uh, clear. And then third, it is true, there were some papers that were published in the last 10 years justifying a potential increase of the, of the target for central banks based mainly on the argument that the natural interest rate was low. And this uh, leads to a high probability of the central bank to reach the zero lower bound or the lower bound on interest rates, okay? If anything, the discussion in the last two years has been on a potential increase of the natural interest rates, which in, other, uh, in, in this discussion would mean that there is less of a necessity, less of a need for an increase in the target in order to reduce the probability of reaching uh, the, the, lower, the lower bound. Thank you. Mario Centeno. Well, thank you uh, for, for the question. I will not be adding uh, anything uh, to what uh, Francois, Pablo, and Andrew said. I just, I just want to, to remind us uh, of, of something very important. We are here uh, talking about crisis and what is the role of central banks uh, in, in crisis. But we also have to be completely clear about what is the situation today. Inflation is coming down faster than w the way up. Uh, it was a very long way up because we actually uh, uh, felt the effect of different crises. First, the COVID, then the war and the energy crisis. So this was a succession of crises. So uh, it took us to the peak way slower and longer than, than in previous crises, but the way down so far has been faster. So we need to kind of fuel this process and be very confident that we can make it. The labor market in Europe today is the strongest labor market we ever had in Europe. 
contrary to what happens in the US or the UK, in which the labor market is smaller today. Participation rate in Europe since the lowest point in COVID is 3.3 percentage points higher. We created 8 million jobs. Half of these jobs are occupied by people that were not born in the country in which they are working, which means that mobility in Europe today is much better than before. So we are doing it in Europe, and we need to continue, the, conti to continue this process because this is the best way we can to protect ourselves to the next crisis. We will not know what the next crisis will be, but if we do do our job prior to that, we will be able to fight it much better. Hello. Naoko Ishii, on sait pas quelle est la prochaine. Naoko Ishii, we don't know what the next crisis will be, but according to you, what do you think is the biggest threat? What is the main risk or the main shock you think uh, that uh, the central banks should be concerned about? Well, um, in my uh, personal view, we are still in a very massive long-term crisis of if we were able to really make a good transition to greening, cleaning, or linear, um, cleaner uh, economy or not. And we are not really doing too well in that. Actually, the day-by-day -day clock is ticking, and the day-by-day -day that the deadline is, is getting closer. So to me, that the, uh, uh, one of the shared challenges that if the financial sector together uh, to fit central bank, uh, banks are uh, the very important integral part or core part of this financial system can really chart us and then um, uh, steer us uh, to this rather very turbulent uh, transition period or not. Uh, so uh, one, uh, there are a few instruments I think that um, you have at hand that then, uh, yes, you have already have uh, some several scenario exercise that you are doing a lot of and, uh, um, uh, assessment, uh, stress test, but then uh, one thing which I think the entire economy, not just the financial sector only, can do is how to find a, put, a way to internalize the externalities. I, I think that then, uh, some governor already mentioned, um, maybe Pablo, that then, uh, so, so that then, the entire economy should be able to find that then, how to put the price on carbon, how to value the natural capital, which we have been eaten up so significantly. So how we can that change those and the pricing or valuing those important that the uh, natural capital and also kind of penalizing that the, uh, uh, the uh, external bad. So that's something I think that we should really do it. But just going back to my original point of that, uh, how I see this uh, huge transition crisis, we can't really achieve the green transformation only among advanced countries. We have to find a way to how to help that the global south are also aligning their economic pathway to a net zero goal, and we haven't really done it yet quite good. Macron's summit message was very clear. The current international financial system is not fit for purpose. That the reasonably, uh, um, uh, that I wouldn't say cheap, but the reasonable cost of the finance is not really flowing to those countries to help that the green transformation so that we have to find a way how we can really do it. Uh, then that the, uh, also I just mentioned the natural capital, our economy has been eating up the very foundation of our prosperity, which is a natural capital. Very recently, the world is also waking up and to see how we can internalize the value of natural capital. This is another important challenge I think we have to take on. Merci beaucoup. Il nous reste, avant de conclure, huit minutes et j'aimerais... Thank you very much. We have eight minutes before we can conclude and I would like to give you the floor as you uh, play, gave us the pleasure of coming here on a Sunday morning. Please uh, show your hand if you want to ask a question. I believe there's one here on my left. Uh, go ahead and ask your question, but introduce uh, first. I'm an economist. I used to work in Bercy. My uh, specialty is monetary economy, which explains my question, which is a bit theoretical. Um, we have in economic monetary theory, the theory of Mandel, the income triangle of incompatibility, fixed exchange rates, free capital movement, and central bank independency. Shouldn't we write this theory today? 
and replace the independence of central banks by its complementarity with the fiscal policy. And to end the question, I joined the call for action for a fiscal union in the euro area, but we're repeating this Alors, call since if, 10 years. Thank you all. Et oui, il faut pas que la, merci. Il faut pas que la, uh, rendez le micro. Voilà. Faut pas que la question soit plus plus longue que la réponse. Uh, please, uh, thank you. A short answer for this question, but a, one brief answer. If we can have as many uh, interventions as possible, no one wants to answer that. Uh, don't fight over it. Huh? Maybe France. Well, uh, well, why not? Let me defend and illustrate independence, uh, which may not be always popular, including amongst the political authorities. I believe independence is fully democratic. What do I mean by that? We did not give ourselves this independence. We didn't wake up one morning and say, oh, how great it were, would be if we were independent. For example, in the Eurozone, remember the Maastricht Treaty, and remember we voted in September 92. Uh, and uh, we voted for the independence of the central bank, and we did so for pragmatic reasons, practical reasons, because we realized, and this is still true, that independent central banks are a better protection for the value of money, of currency, they avoid inflation. Why? Because when you have to rise the interest rate, it's never highly popular and it's always more difficult for political authorities. The counterpart for uh, the uh, independence is, are two essential points. First of all, we must have a clear mandate. I talked about clear responsibilities. We must have an exempt uh, uh, objective and a measurable result afterwards. And uh, being independent does not mean uh, being isolated. Then your question is complicated. Once we have this independence with some limitations, how do we talk to the other economic authorities, including the budget authority that Pablo mentioned? This is based on coordination, on dialogue. We say things about what we think would be a good thing in terms of budgetary policy. But we, you can't put everything in one single uh, basket because otherwise the monetary policy would be too slow. We've seen this in most uh, advanced economies. Uh, the central bank is independent. It's not the case in emerging countries. And unfortunately, the list of countries where budget dominates the central bank and therefore where it is difficult to rise interest rates, this list uh, corresponds uh, to the countries uh, that do not have 5% inflation as we have in the Eurozone, but countries that may have 50 or 500% inflation. Well, you have central bankers who are here to answer your questions, even though they may not be technical. So you have the mic, sir. Yes, thank you. I'm a researcher in political sciences and in law. And I work on the topic of the European Central Bank and the uh, management of crisis in terms of community law, uh, EU law, and uh, economic and finance uh, issues. What is your question, sir? Well, if we think of the last intervention by the governor of the uh, Banque de France uh, talking about independence, do you think that independence is uh, a handicap, quote unquote, for the solving the crisis in Europe, or do you think it's a uh, position that is well defended by European treaty and which enables central banks to play their role, their monetary role, or to play its financial role? Give, please uh, wrap up, sir. Because if you think of the uh, American Federal Bank, there's a big difference. If we think of the uh, US uh, Fed, the Central European Bank, the, uh, the ECB is highly independent from uh, uh, European government. 
Well, you give your viewpoint, uh, but I would like people to ask questions. So we'll take a batch of questions and then we'll have the answers. Go ahead, sir, here. And please try to ask short questions, not give your viewpoint. Yes, coming back to, your, the, to the 3% or uh, in these uh, rencontres, uh, we talked about the green crisis and the fact that there would be an increase uh, in prices due to this uh, crisis. Uh, we know there will be an increase in prices and more than 2% fluctuation. So your question is, how can you integrate uh, these uh, prices uh, in uh, the fight uh, against inflation? Okay, one last question maybe because we only have two minutes left. Okay, uh, schematically, Patrick Portolano, uh, will there be one day a central bank for carbon to manage the emissions, uh, the carbon emissions like we manage uh, the monetary mass and so we can get a negative inflation on fossil fuels? Well, two minutes left. Who wants to answer these questions? Maybe Jean-Paul Paulin could uh, conclude, or I don't know. Andrew, would you like to say a few words? Okay, 30 seconds uh, for answer. Very, brief, very briefly on carbon, I think the question is how to price carbon and therefore have a market in carbon. You don't need a central bank, you need to price carbon in a market, I think. I know that's a very uh, Anglo-Saxon thing to say. <laughs> For once, I will be Anglo-Saxon because I agree about that. Uh, your question is part of one of the proposals by Christian Gaulier, who is an economist from Toulouse. He uh, suggested having a central carbon bank. I hope that it could be political authorities still with this idea of a clear mandate and a means to act. But maybe we should need an independent authority. Coming back to this, I would like to say that the central bank is not the only uh, authority. We have here Benoit Curé, who represents the competitive uh, 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 element. So we have to have the two, the mandate and the capacity. Jean-Paul Paulin, can you conclude? Yes, in two words, we will uh, uh, remember that uh, all the governors uh, said that they were against increasing the uh, inflation goal. Secondly, they also said that central banks cannot do everything by themselves and that a lot of things have to be done via the budget policies, especially within the Eurozone. And third thing, even though they can't do everything, they have a number of goals uh, for uh, about which they're quite legitimate, in fact, and they feel that they can reach their objectives. Well, this is uh, probably one of the elements uh, for the coming uh, econ economics in the future. Thank you all. Thank you all.
Bonjour à tous et bienvenue. Hello everyone, welcome to this session on accelerating sustainable development. There is one person in this panel that will be speaking English, so for those of you who need headsets, please go and get them. Uh, we have with us Cecilia Lopez, former Minister for Agriculture in Colombia. So we have with us uh, Olivier Pastré, one of the pillars of the Cercle des Economistes. He's written multiple books, the last one being uh, from an economy of abundance to an economy of uh, scarcity, a book that you wrote with uh, Patrick Artus, and which is a reflection on the new economic paradigm. Uh, so in our panel, we have pierre Etienne Franc. Hello. You are the uh, CEO of High24. Uh, Your passion is hydrogen, and you will explain how hydrogen could be a key for sustainable development. Hansel Mutkotz, uh, hello. Uh, sorry for saying good evening, because uh, I am work on the radio uh, for an evening program. You are a professor in Harvard. You are formal uh, director general of Bundesbank. Uh, you are German, and you will give us uh, your macroeconomic and uh, European vision of sustainable development. Uh, Sheikh Kanté, minister in charge of the Plan Senegal 2035. You are the envoy of President Macky Sall, and you will tell us how African countries, and in particular Senegal, can uh, prepare for an acceleration in sustainable development. With us, we have Cecilia Lopez. Uh, hello, you're president of CISOE, former minister for agriculture of Colombia under the presidency of Gustavo Petro. You took part in many governments, different uh, types of governments, five if I'm not mistaken. You will tell us about Latin America and how these countries can accelerate and face the challenge of the acceleration of sustainable development. Paolo Ribota, hello. You're the general manager of Zurich Insurance in France. You're Italian and you will uh, give us your European vision of the funding of uh, sustainable development, and you will explain to us the role of insurance policies in the funding of this sustainable development. Olivier, now that I introduced you, please give us three paths uh, for reflection to start the discussion. Hello, everyone, and thank you. Uh, thank you, Stephanie. Hail, Stephanie. By way of introduction, to three points. Obviously, France invented the concept of sustainable development in 1346 with Philippe de Valois, who was uh, the uh, manager of uh, the forests of the kingdom, and he was in charge of uh, 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 supporting uh, the uh, forests of the kingdom and make sure that they were maintained in a proper status. So once again, France was world champion, but I'm joking, in fact. It wasn't always the case. Then in 72, the Club of Rome, uh, the Meadows Report. In 1980, Jacques Dul uh, was the uh, Think Global Act Local. And in 97, the Breutland Report, which we can consider as the birth date uh, of uh, the political concept of uh, sustainable development. I'm not going to uh, take too much time, because I know that the speakers, thanks to Stephanie, will uh, sort of boost your uh, morals. But uh, uh, in my opinion, Sustainable development is an economic concept uh, which is one of the quote-unquote shittiest, sorry about that expression, uh, in the way that you really don't know what you're talking about when you talk about sustainable development. Uh, so if I may quote Luc Ferry, which I don't often do, uh, the expression sings more than it speaks to people. Uh, so uh, as we can't really define what uh, sustainable development is, except 
for this uh, panel. And after this panel, you will know what it's all about. But uh, if we want to know what it is not, sustainable development is uh, obviously not a panacea, really. It's not the miracle solution. There are so many things at stake, so many goals uh, that weren't reached on time so that we have to remain extremely modest. Sustainable development is uh, not uh, green growth either. As honestly, if it were green growth, we would know it. Uh, sustainable development is not either something that has short-term impact, uh, and uh, you can only uh, see what sustainable develop, uh, development is over the long term. And we'll talk about the pace of sustainable development. And uh, sustainable development is not a universal force, uh, I must say. Each country has its own history in that field. Universality is not necessarily of the essence. Uh, so then we, uh, Stephanie, we structured the organization of the discussion around three topics. Uh, the three topics we feel are most important and which uh, might uh, bring in solutions. First, innovation. Secondly, uh, funding. And three, pace, uh, meaning the short term, the long term, what's in between. So much for the structure of the discussions. And once again, this panel is going to be a, f a flagship moment in the Rencontre Dext. As for at last, we'll end up defining the concept and the notion, and we'll end up with the right policy to be implemented. To please Jean Hervé. So that's the challenge we have, Olivier. 45 minutes to do that. It's a bit short to define what sustainable development is all about. Let's start with innovation, which is a key for sustainable development. Funding is also obviously the essence, and then uh, the pace. First, let's start with innovation. Uh, Pierre Etienne-Franc, is hydrogen one of the solutions to accelerate sustainable development? And is innovation an essential tool to develop hydrogen? Well, hydrogen is the, uh, as we say, the last wheel uh, of the dynamic of uh, sustainable development. We started with solar power, wind power uh, years ago. We stood at 400 euros per megawatt per hour. We now end up at 20, so strong development. The third point is uh, cells, uh, batteries, uh, to help decarbonate transportation. And the third point is uh, hydrogen, which is uh, uh, the complement brought by uh, electrons uh, to for energies that we don't know how to uh, uh, cover, like uh, heavy transportation or paper paste, paper mills, etc. Uh, so hydrogen is uh, uh, an industry that already exists. 100 million tons of hydrogens are uh, uh, prepared every year, manufactured every year. But we have to deca decarbonate it. But uh, tomorrow, we must have uh, the green energy with the electrolysis of uh, water and also use them for uh, fuel cells in order to decarbonate mobility. Over the past 15 years, we've had the innovation. 80,000 vehicles in the world are uh, hydrogen-based. Uh, uh, people don't know it. So it's almost nothing, but five years ago, there were none. So 
the water electrolysis is something uh, that has been in existence for a long time. So what we're do- looking at now is not so much the technology that works, it's reliable, the, the cost is dropping, but it's uh, the scale. The scaling up, and for that you have two uh, challenges in terms of mindset. You must accept to reason in terms of systems. We're uh, talking about a very different energy model. We used to take a stock and turn it into a flow. That was the past. A stock of raw material turned into a flow. Now this is the reverse. We have a lot of flows, and we have to uh, store them and redistribute it. And with hydrogen, you can store abundant uh, sources of energy and from faraway places and take them to places that don't have them. So that's one first thing. And the second uh, mindset issue is at micro level. What is happening now? We see a lot of uh, electrolysis uh, machines, huge ones. Uh, uh, why is it taking so much time? Well, there's uh, some pace, uh, some uh, uh, speed is at uh, uh, stake, but we seem to be afraid of trial and error. In China, you have 150 suppliers of electrolysis. Some started in the hydrogen uh, uh, six months ago. And when I was talking to my friends here, they say there's even more. So obviously, they're not very reliable, they're not expensive, but they're not efficient, etc. But every time they make one, they learn from uh, their mistakes. So the Chinese are doing what they did for steel, for textile, for batteries and fuel cells. Every time they do something, they they market, they make headway as they are very numerous, they can drop the cost, and they learn as they deploy. We must deploy. Let's stop thinking that supreme innovation is going to come from the top. Uh, as you learn as you speak, Hans Helmut Kurz, you're a specialist in monetary policy. What is your vision of innovation? Hello? I'm very happy to be here, which is something that everybody says. I'm uh, particularly happy to be here because because uh, I've been friends with Olivier for about 40 years. So it's uh, uh, great to uh, see such great economists here, and I really enjoyed all the discussions. And if I may, I'm going to refer to all these discussions. My French is so terrible, it wouldn't allow. I don't want to butcher your language. Innovation. I would like to make three points. The first is... The micro... Uh, I would like what, it, what concerns innovation, three points. A boring eco- uh, economist one, which is, of course, one, one has to achieve uh, an increase what, in what economists call total factor productivity. That means you use resources efficiently. Using resources efficiently requires that you, that you have the proper prices. Internalizing uh, any, any of the bad stuff which is now uh, resulting from a mispricing of many, many resources. And, and the most critical or the, most, uh, the biggest externality, as Nicholas Stern called it, is of course uh, greenhouse gas, uh, gas emissions. So total f- factor productivity is, is, is very important. And what uh, Olivier said, I was trying to scribble up what he said, the, concepts, the concept uh, sings more than it explains. The concept doesn't really exist in terms of uh, political innovation. It does exist for quite a long to- time in terms of um, reasoning about that. There was a very important report by Jean-Paul Fitoussi, uh, Amartya Sen, and Joe Stiglitz in 2009, where they basically came up with the strong proposition that we have to go beyond GDP. So this argument of green growth is mainly referring to, very often, to greening GDP growth. But it's a completely underperforming indicator. It doesn't acknowledge for so many things. Let's begin with, doesn't account for anything which is not priced on markets. It does not, uh, it, it actually uh, takes in defensive expenditures which are wasting resources as increasing uh, 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 welfare. So it's, it's a really improper way of dealing with welfare, known for a very long time. 
uh, Jim Tobin and uh, Bill Nortos have written about it in the early 1990s, and there's been lots of development. So we need conceptual uh, innovation. And the third point I do think, which is uh, very important, is to think how to measure that, uh, how, to, uh, how to address that, and also how to get into a debate, a public debate, which cares for those who are most hurt by it. For example, I heard just before that uh, carbon pricing would be, you have to tell me when I have to stop, that carbon pricing would be an Anglo-Saxon concept. I don't know what Anglo-Saxon or, or whatever it is. Uh, it is, of course, a very economical concept, but it comes with strong distributional consequences. It will, in particular, hurt those in the lower strata uh, uh, of our societies. Hence, if you want to use it, then I would think it's a very important concept to use. You have to think how to deal with uh, ramifications which uh, have societal impacts. Gilets jaunes was some of those societal impacts. Am I too long? No, you are. Uh, yeah. So three, three uh, innovations, boring economics, total factor productivity. Secondly, uh, coming up with a proper dashboard because it's multidimensional, uh, lots of objectives. And here I would like to refer to what Patrick Atus said uh, less, uh, le yesterday. Yes, Patrick said we have to prioritize. So you, you have Définir to, des priorités. Uh, bon. You have to, uh, 270 social development goals. At 17 social development goals, 270 indicators. So we have to become clear about the dashboard we are using. Check Kanté. Le Sénégal s'est engagé à augmenter. Check Kanté. Senegal has committed to increase its share of renewable energy to 40% by 2030 with a funding of 2.3 billion euros. You have written in a book that you just published that Africa has to trace its own path based on its history, its values, and its uh, aspirations. Are you betting on innovation? Yes, absolutely. First of all, let's agree on innovation and uh, think of the destructive uh, uh, creation of Schumpeter. Today, we're talking about hydrogen. Yesterday, it was a candle. Now, uh, this is a basic necessity both for companies and states. Companies that do not invest into in innovation are bound to disappear in a contest of uh, in a context of huge competition. And the same goes for states. Uh, if you do not uh, become proactive and you do not try to satisfy social demand, you are heading for problems. So uh, Senegal, with its uh, uh, Plan Senegal Emergent, has uh, changed its references in terms of functional planning based on sustainable development, economically viable, socially fair. And uh, when we talk about innovation in terms of NSG, in 2012, when President Macky Sall came into power, we had 1,514 megawatt uh, uh, power installed. We, we had uh, co constant uh, uh, energy cuts uh, uh, that could last a whole day. Now we stand at uh, 1,400 megawatts. And uh, more interesting than that, in tw 2012, to fight against the most unacceptable inequalities, only 1,648 uh, villages were electrified. Uh, so uh, from uh, w w it's, uh, we electrified 29 villages uh, 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 out of 100, while now we are almost ready to have uh, energy everywhere. We have the largest wind, uh, windmill farm uh, in Africa. And Senegal is not an isolated case. Senegal is part of the world. It is heading for modernity. It has its own processes, its own challenges in a world where the rupture points are more frequent than stability points. We are working on resource production, uh, uh, accumulation of wealth, and there's, there is a disarticulation of the planetary systems. Today, 
Africa is the one that is contributing less to climate change, but paying it uh, at the highest price. Uh, so we have to have a global innovation, uh, an innovation that will cover the whole planet. And uh, we, there is a lack of generosity uh, in uh, cooperation, which is why uh, the reason why in my book I developed this principle of uh, uh, social and uh, solidarity uh, economy based on principles of endogenous uh, development uh, uh, without which uh, an economy couldn't uh, live. Cecilia Lopez, you are a former Minister of Agriculture from Colombia or, uh, uh, under the government of uh, Gustavo Petro. You're no longer part of the government for your country and for Latin America, but especially in Colombia, you have to make sure that you have peace and at the time, tr uh, same time aim at sustainable development. A difficult equation. Huh? pleasure as a Latin American to be here because Latin America has disappeared from the European discourse. Before going to innovation, I want just to go very fast to three points. First, what is sustainable development? It's an agenda, an agenda that many countries signed in 200, 2016. The first thing I want to say is that being clear, being realistic, at the actual pace, the world will not accomplish the Sustainable Development Agenda by 2030. So we have to be very clear. It's not not to be optimistic, it's being realistic. What does that mean? That means that we have to do it in a different way. And then we have to recognize barriers. If we don't identify why we have done wrong things, why we're not accomplishing this agenda, we're not going to move in a positive way. And the third point I want to talk is about mitigation. This is a general, generalized discourse, and I agree with you, my colleague from Senegal, because this is not the discourse that you, we developing countries should have. People, where are the people? The people that are the victims, they are contributing very little, as you said, but we are suffering. But you know the critical thing is that President Petro, President of Colombia, went to Paris and had exactly the same speech that President Macron. Exactly the same speech. Uh, the world is going to end because we are not controlling the emissions. And you know what? Our reality in Colombia, in developing countries, is people. We need to reduce poverty and inequality. Otherwise, we won't have sustainable development. So I think this is something that we have to be very critical about. The discourse of developing countries has to be different. Why don't we ask the rich countries, you have to reduce emissions by a certain percent. Why don't we do that? I invite you, African and Latin America, let's change our discourse. And now innovation. Innovation, creating new value. You know? What you said, my colleague from Senegal, there is a funding gap. Nobody cares about funding. We have to do, in the development countries, a, a, an effort to, fund, uh, to, to find resources for innovation. But we are supposed to have a support from the rich countries. You rich countries are doing nothing. Innovation is not being financed. That will be my contribution. On va revenir hein, sur, uh, justement, le financement. Uh, Paolo Ribotta. Well, funding, Paolo Ribotta, about uh, innovation. You're an insurer. Uh, innovation means new risks, so I guess uh, it means uh, new policies for insurance companies that have to adapt. Well, hello, everyone. First of all, uh, the role of the insurance sector in innovation is a role that is based on our present uh, specificities. What do we do? We have to learn and understand what are the risks and uh, quantify these risks, give them a price. It's no use quantifying things if uh, then you do not have uh, the proper system to transfer and manage the risks. 
the, the other role of the insurance sector, which is a basic role, is that of uh, acting as a motor, as a driver, uh, to uh, bring uh, the various parties together uh, concerning these risks. So we must combine the global organizations, national organizations, various communities, so that we can uh, not only take the risks, but set up the right plans in order to have a real impact on economies and on uh, uh, so the social life. And it's all the more important when you look at the impact of climate change. The impact of climate change, as was uh, very aptly said, are even uh, stronger on a number of countries like developing countries or countries that have a different situation from uh, the developed countries. And if you look at what happened in Paris in 2015 at uh, COP21 uh, when uh, we launched an insurance forum, which is a forum where all my insur insurance uh, colleagues and a number of important colleagues get together to try and reach uh, the uh, SDGs of the UN. Uh, but the Insurance Development Fund uh, Forum, as its name indicates, uh, is organized around four pillars uh, based on commitments and partnerships. The idea is to increase impact through innovation and uh, project execution. And it has also the idea of being a leading influence. And a lot of uh, initiatives have been taken by the Insurance Forum. And I would like to mention one, and my German colleague will probably recognize that the Tripartite uh, Alliance. It's an, uh, uh, an organization of the uh, um, uh, Insurance Development Forum via UNDP and uh, the uh, Sustainable Development uh, uh, Organization. So the idea is uh, to help up to 500 million uh, people benefit in the world in order to transfer the risk, let's say, lift the risks that are weighing on some communities and have them borne by the capital market. So, uh, and we have 5 billion euros available. In 2022, we have 20 countries and 22 projects that are ongoing. And in these uh, 20 countries, uh, five projects are already ongoing. Five projects are in funding phase. And you have the funds? Where, where, where do you find the funds to fund this? Yes, uh, we deploy funds and we deploy capacities uh, that are our own. We are, um, we trust uh, uh, these approaches and uh, uh, we make these funds available. Today, we have uh, 2.2 billion euros uh, to, of capacity of risk transfer that are on the table. They're tabled. And there are a lot of projects that are aimed at communities to help reduce the impact of uh, climate events and consequences of climate change on these communities. They're often uh, rural communities or communities in developing countries or in poor countries. So insurance companies have a role to play, and not only my company, but uh, all insurance uh, companies to federate uh, people around these uh, approaches. OK, funds, money uh, is at the heart of everything. But who must pay? Uh, do, you, uh, do you manage uh, to uh, convince uh, uh, people to pay and invest in hydrogen? Because if I listen to you, we're running late. Should we have a global fund that we can't even, uh, in fact, uh, supply to fund hydrogen? So good. Well, we have to uh, sketch out a roadmap if uh, the financial institutions are to be roped in. We've done that. We uh, showed them the role of hydrogen in the economy. And now this is widely shared by all countries that want to move forward with the transition. So we have to sketch out the challenges, and then we have the energy transition, of course. We have to multiply by 10 energy expenditure. And then we have to bring people together in development projects. We did that by creating 
this uh, joint company with Altium and Evercat. We raised uh, an initial amount of two billion. That's quite uh, atypical. In the fund, half of the investment are in, come from industry. And had the financiers not followed, they would have uh, done it. The other half is big institutions in uh, uh, financial institutions in France, Germany, the U.S., and elsewhere, and they wouldn't have joined had uh, we not already roped in uh, industry. El Liquide, Vinci, uh, all these companies have invested together with us. They put up a hundred million, and the fund has created an initial market of uh, two billion. We won't capture everything, but that's a, a, a scope of two billion. And people have minority stakes with others, with the state financing, and we're multiplying things by 10, furthermore. In other words, the momentum is there. We're building up a mass of money, and we'll be able to accompany a sustainable development through major projects. In the last stage, is the one we launched thanks to our link between Algion and others with Club Swift. We have connected the two worlds, and now all the big sovereign funds are saying, give us the rules, give us rules of traceability for hydrogen so that the monetization becomes possible, so that we can roll out the infrastructure based on really uh, stringent and, and uh, proper rules. We need to build up this tempo, and that's the role of uh, uh, public spending as well financial institutions, how can they accompany sustainable development? We heard from the boss of the uh, Bank of France. He said we have to focus on inflation, uh, keep it at 2%, we'll succeed. Now, what about the other financial institutions in Europe? Can they accompany uh, sustainable development uh, in light of the indicators you've mentioned? Well, for example. There's, there's the European Investment Bank, which has been engaged for a very long time in, in those activities. Here in France, you have BPI. They are also taking care of some of them, but that's completely underperforming in terms of the dimension of the, of the problem. So there are, there are basically uh, two venues. One is public sector, which means budget, which means taxes or debt. Given that we have a significant amount of debt, which might... Uh, become problematic at a, at, at a certain point of time, you have to think about taxes. And, uh, so carbon tax could be used for that, pollution permits could be used for that. Though they are not meant primarily to raise revenue, they are thought to be uh, to reorient the allocation of our economies. And I just learned an interesting argument by Jacques Attali. Uh, Jacques Attali spoke about not, it's not about just increasing expenditures, it's also about thinking, he, of, of course, he is a poet somehow. He spoke of uh, uh, stuff which is killing us and st uh, stuff which is good for us. And he said 50% of what we do in our GDP accounting is uh, la vie morte. Uh, 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 you also need some reorientation. That's why allocation uh, comes in. But it has to be cushioned. It ha you have to take care of those who are, who are poor. And it's not only in poor in our society, it's because also those in... So let the second point private sector. Just look at the, Europe, uh, at the uh, US Investment Reduction Act, which has nothing to do with investment reduction. It's exclusively about launching on a big scale uh, defending the planet, which comes with consequences which are not so nice for us Europeans, but it has a very high multiplier effect. So those 367 billion over 10 years are producing seemingly an effect of 10, 10, 10 times in terms of private sector involvement. So the major part of that will be private sector involvement, and that will be paid by us as consumers because we like the stuff that come, comes out of that. So uh, two venues, uh, and I think... Uh, What's this? They clear l'espoir. I'm not that negative on that. So it, it, you, can, you can make that. L'Europe doit faire son... So Europe uh, must make its own Inflation Reduction Act? ...will do, uh, but you have to think about really... I'm a realist. You have to think about the big nations, what they are doing and how they are doing it, how they are doing it in the Council. So it's not so much about those small countries which simply do not have the means. We have to support them. And I yesterday heard money comes from Brussels. There's zero money coming from Brussels. Exactly zero. It comes from a few places, and those places have to embark on those initiatives. 
And um, if you look, uh, look at the um, Jean Pisani, uh, Ferry, Jean Pisani Ferry, Ferry, uh, oui. uh, rapport. report, you see there's lots of good ideas, but you see that also happening in the case of the Netherlands, Central Plan Bureau, or now uh, my, my small country, Germany. And there's money behind that. Alors justement, sur cette... So, in terms of the North, which is financing, yes, I'm sorry. I just wanted to say a few words. The role of members of the CERC is uh, really to be very frank, even if, if that displeases people. We, what François Guénaud said, is absolutely ridiculous. He's the only person who believes what he said. What is the right target? We need to move forward because the world economy is in a state of crisis. We should stop uh, being childish. We should stop listening to just any old person. Thank you. Yeah, the North needs to help the South. That's part of the global financial pact. We know that you want uh, Africa to be able to uh, come to grips with the problem. But people say you need to transform the world economic system. Countries in the north must participate. Countries in the south suffer much more from climate change uh, and emit uh, very little CO2. I think we have to uh, break, uh, uh, destroy certain taboos that penalize Africa. In OECD, people meet every year to uh, allocate a risk coefficient to Africa. There's a risk of about 5%. And insurances, uh, uh, rating agencies add uh, 10 or 15%. That makes 20%. In Europe, when you have a negative uh, rating, minus zero, that's one thing. But in Africa, we're plus. We have greater risks. When I came to Paris the other day, friends said to me, you're running a risk. In France, you may be attacked. Don't go to France. And I said, well, I came to France with the Gilets Jaunes, and I said, well, this is living democracy, uh, which is the case in Africa and in Europe. So we have this taboo of the OECD. We worked on this together with Professor Lorenzi, and the uh, rating agencies must uh, realize there is no risk in Africa. They should stop increasing the costs of our transactions. When the cost of capital is uh, too high, uh, then projects are killed in the bud. We thought of setting up an African mechanism for financial stability. This mechanism has existed in Europe. Uh, uh, it dates back centuries. It dates from William the Orange. And that's uh, uh, likewise, you have something similar in the US. So we need global innovation, global governance. Africa should not continue to suffer from climate change and demographic problems. We have tremendous assets. We have a, a, a huge percentage of young people in our population. That's a, a powerful asset if it's properly used. The European population will drop because uh, Europe has already fallen underneath the, the renewal threshold in terms of population. So I think we have to take all this into consideration and we have to take account of the place of Africa in the transition. European countries in the north can't benefit from our fossil fuels and tell us, well, don't emit any CO2 anymore, because the technology behind this transition has not yet been 
uh, fully understood and brought under control. It's the problem of fossil fuels. But we need, above all, to master the processes of CO2 emissions. You need to limit the production of fossil fuels. That's what people say to us. Well, what's going to happen? Production will drop. Uh, supply and demand will play their part. Countries will increase renewables. Uh, central banks will combat inflation, increase rates, and it's a vicious circle. And the whole world will suffer, not to mention the impact of the war in Ukraine. <laughs> so innovation is the key. Innovation must be comprehensive and generation in order to kindle hope, and not just hope, so that the whole of the world can hope once again. And the pace is very important, of course. <laughs> Cecilia Lopez, maybe you'd like to react to what's just been said by Sheikh Conte. It's interesting to see that in your country, I fully agree with what has been said. I do indeed agree with the uh, speakers, but I fear that you're a bit too pessimistic or optimistic. In other words, you criticize, you say, the best lies ahead. No, these rating agencies do not want to change. The system is designed in such a way that the South is not financed or is financed at a cost that has nothing to do with the quality of the growth in the South. So we really have to get going. We have to move our asses, in other words. Cecilia Lopez. So we have to really move our asses. That's a, a radical stance. We have Gustavo Petro, who's banned the exporting of oil. That is uh, quite a radical measure. And how can you finance this in a country like Colombia? I agree that uh, we cannot just criticize. <laughs> we really have to contribute to do the agenda together. At least Africa is so lucky that you are in OECD agenda. For Latin America, it's harder. We are considered uh, developing countries in a higher way, which is not right. Africa is, I don't know how you said it in English, uh, is coming very close uh, to Latin America in terms of economic growth. I was very surprised about that. You are growing much more than Latin America as a region. Nobody knows about that, but it is true. We were worried about it. We're happy, but we were worried. <laughs> okay, about, about this, how the, can we contribute? Financing has two problems. First, lacks of funds. We cannot expect, expect only governments and governments from rich countries do what they are supposed to do. Remember Paris Agreement. Developed countries must help developing countries to obtain the sustainable the, the agenda goals. We have to do an effort. Uh, innovation and fi financing for the innovation and for uh, technical assistance is very low in our countries. That's a theme we have, and we have to make an effort. The second point is we have to call the private sector. Where is the private sector? I'm glad we have representatives here. You have a role to play. Our private sector that is isolated from this debate and the international private sector. But there is another problem. Funds are going to mitigation. They are not going to adaptation. Mitigation, what is mitigation? Just large-scale investment to reduce emissions. That's the rich countries' discourse. Because we, as you said, we are not contributing in a significant way to these emissions. But then, what is adaptation? Adaptation adds significant resources to control the adverse effects of climate change on people. Again, people. People are behind this debate. They are hidden from this debate. And the problem is that the 
All the funds are going much more to mitigation and very little to adaptation. Of course, national countries have to support that, but we need international support. Why we're not talking about this? I think this is an opportunistic position of developing countries. We talk about mitigation because that is good for your ears and you have the money. Then we have to change the discourse. We have to really do an effort, not only for adaptation, but also because we have a contribution to mitigation that needs your support. You know what? We, and I'm talking about Latin America, we have all the minerals that we need for climate change. We need support to, to those, to, those uh, to, to be able to bring to the offer, to the supply of the world of these new minerals. And then for that, what do we need? We need transition. What does that mean? Time. You are not giving us time. That's something that developing countries need for sustainable development. Time. Du temps, il faut. Paolo Ribotta, alors les assureurs, justement. D'après ce qu'a dit Cheikh Kanté, pour l'Afrique, quand même. Paolo Ribotta, on the insurer's side. I don't know. But uh, insurers have a part to play. There's a major challenge to, to tackle. A number of interesting things are currently being done, and we are contributing as an insurance sector. We've talked about mitigation here. I'm talking only for the sector in which I am. We're making considerable efforts. As a financial lever, we are investors like other financial institutions. But over and beyond that, we also play a part in raising funds and capital to be able to finance a certain number of plans and programs. We also have an approach which is well developed when it comes to prevention, the prevention of risks, the risk control, risk management. We have some very concrete examples in this area. I'm referring to an initiative which was launched by my group in 2018, and it's called Zurich Flood Resilience Alliance. Flooding between 2010 and 2019, well, about 670,000 people in the world were affected. A million people around the world were affected. And this is bound to increase given climate change. Flooding will increase. We've always thought, and we are truly ambitious in this area, that when there is a flood, Everyone suffers, the economy comes to a halt, and we have a vision which consists in saying when there's a flood, countries, communities, people should be in a position not only to continue working, but they should be able to continue to flourish. They should be able to uh, continue despite the impact of the flooding. You can do a number of practical things to this end. And that's important for people who are affected by uh, these floods. We have, in our alliance, we have included a certain number of outside entities that do research work because our raw material is data. And using data, we have searchers together with other kinds of professionals who are setting up prevention plans. A prevention plan is based on data, and data is mathematical. The idea then is to enable communities facing floods to anticipate the risk. We want to prevent the risk. The idea is to create behaviors so that when there is a flood and flooding is bound to happen, the impact of the flood will be much less great. And once we've done that, and we really worked hard on this matter, we have tried to lend credibility to this approach. With this uh, credibility, uh, thanks to this approach, we went to uh, see the decision makers, the financiers, people financing the investment, and we said, well, here we are. We have these people, these communities that are credible. They've all re they already know how to react in the case of flooding. And the people putting up the finance, uh, 
we went to see them, plus the policy decision makers, the idea being to create the tools to uh, boost investment. So I think prevention and the certification and the changing of behavior can play a really important part because these communities can then become more credible vis-a-vis -vis the people putting up the funds. We only have six minutes left. Insurers play a marginal role because they only react based on the information given them. You say to insurer now, in this area there's a risk, the insurer may react simply by including the risk in the plan. In Dakar, under Jean-Hervier Christian, we have given thought to the uh, Dakar consensus with seven paradigms, mobilize internal and external resources, good governance. We have to prevent shocks, but in a realistic manner. We have to create partnerships, uh, use raw materials. The perception of risk doesn't exist sufficiently, and global governance must change so that Africa has a greater part to play. $560 million in investment were granted to specific projects. And this money would not have arrived had we not adopted this approach to boost credibility. Cecilia Lopez, did you want to add something? We want to really change and, and get uh, and get the social uh, the sustainable development agenda. One sentence: discourse, too much discourse, no. very little action. We need action both in developed and development countries. And the second thing I want to say is why we demand time because we have to move, we have to make a productive transformation. Colombia has 50% of their exports come from oil and coal. If we want to move to a sustainable development, we need time to do that. Please, European community, allow us to sell our new products so we can make a transition. We need that you give us time. Donc vous n'êtes pas d'accord avec votre président qui... So you don't agree with your president who has banned exports of oil? That was one of his goals. Stop the exploitation of oil immediately. It's impossible. You have to make a transition. You have to stimulate the agricultural sector. I can talk as the former minister of agriculture. That is a lot of potential. But you know what you're doing in Europe? You're asking us to stop deforestation. Otherwise, we cannot export uh, fruits to here. You are your, our market. We cannot do it in one day, month. We need time. Du temps. Time for hydrogen too. We have to speed up, uh, in other words, hydrogen. The regulation has to be validated so that thousands of projects can finally be uh, decided on. I'd like to say two things, the pace, the speed. Like in a concert, we have to manage different scores. We have to manage the fact that if you take Africa, well, CO2 emissions, that's less than one ton a year per African. In any case, they will want to use fossil fuels to uh, improve standards of living. Yet we, at the same time, we have to go from six to seven tons per inhabitant per year, or 15 in the US, to two. So we have to uh, use much less energy. So it's a total difference. There's another very fundamental issue. We have to go extremely fast to, to change our use of energy. And at the same time, we have to work in symbiosis so that the resources we use can regenerate. We have to uh, learn to live more slowly. The pace of growth is exponential, and that no longer works. What do you mean by that? In other words, we have to go fast to change our model and accept that our concept of growth and, and wealth, uh, uh, all this should change radically in our developed countries. So you're in favor of uh, de-growth? No. It's a very different kind of growth in terms of its components. It should be less correlated with energy, otherwise we'll hit a brick wall. It's because of energy that we can move, uh, heat our homes. Uh, we can't uh, do without energy completely. Two or three very quick points. I've been interested in the matter for about 30 years now, and I have learned a very great deal from reinsurers. 
So I, I side to a significant degree with Paolo because the price signals they send do have allocative uh, consequences going forward. Se second point, we have to think about not the private sector only doing this, it is industrial policy which, which we need in terms of orienting because we are speaking of common goods, public goods, where you have too much of free riding going on and basic research won't be done by, uh, uh, by, the, by the private sector. So we have to think about industrial policy and don't shy away with that and just look at the case of the IIA. And they, they, that's my last remark. The IIA was also about how to socially embed and cushion uh, the, the, the transformation. So that's what Heather Bushy said just two days ago. Okay, Olivier, do you conclude? Olivier, would you like to draw a conclusion? Would you allow me huh? a final sentence? The final sentence. Is there a real solidarity between the North and the South to accomplish this agenda of climate change? Olivier, y a une solidarité entre... Olivier, is there solidarity between North and South? Well, the answer is in the question. Of course, there is. That's not an issue. So I would just like to draw a few conclusions. All the speakers have been wonderful. And I think the room can thank you all. It was wonderful. We have stuck to our commitments. We have pretty much defined sustainable development. Look at the report of the discussion and you will see that we've achieved quite tangible results in terms of answering these questions. And then as to the three subjects, financing, the duration, sustainability, they're also, I think, we have talked about uh, economic and political solutions, which don't all converge, but at least Everything was pretty consistent. So I'd like to thank everybody. I'd like to thank the audience. I'd like to thank uh, Stephanie. Thank you to you all. Merci en tout cas, hein, c'était...